I would like you to try to guess what activity I'm describing. Are you ready? Let's go. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups. Of course, one group may be sufficient, depending on how much you have to do. If you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, then that is the next step. Otherwise, you are pretty well set. It is important not to overdo things. That is, it is better to do too few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications can easily arise. A mistake can be expensive as well. After the procedure is completed, one arranges the materials into different groups again. Then, they can be put into their appropriate places. Eventually, they can be used once more, and the whole cycle will then have to be repeated. So, can you guess what I'm describing? If not, I'll give you a hint. This is something you do, hopefully, on at least a weekly basis. Still not sure? It's doing laundry. Arrange things into different groups. Lack of facilities. They can be used once more. The whole cycle will have to be repeated. That's not obvious, is it? Why is that? You know all of these words, and you are, hopefully, familiar with the process of doing laundry. Well, I didn't give you any background or context. I didn't introduce this paragraph and prepare you to understand this procedure. I could have said, I'm going to describe a common, everyday procedure that you likely do about once a week. In addition, the input was not very comprehensible. The reading was poorly written, ambiguous, and hard to follow. Well, this is how English learners may feel when they are asked to summarize a text that contains unfamiliar or foreign content. It's not easy. Can you think of a time when you have lacked background knowledge and it has perhaps even hindered your comprehension? I remember feeling very confused and overwhelmed when I joined our local high school soccer booster club. At the meetings, the members would discuss how to use booster resources, which tournaments offered the best opportunities for our players, and which fields would be utilized for the various local soccer teams. I just felt lost. I understood the words, of course, but I couldn't follow the conversation very well. I needed someone to sit me down and explain the ins and outs, not just of soccer, but of Hudson, Wisconsin soccer. So, why is it important to build background knowledge and link it to prior learning? I like to think of this as a bridge that links past learning to new concepts. We must help our students integrate new information with what they already know. Why? Because many students don't automatically make these connections. We must make them explicit and help them. We can build background in a number of different ways. We can show a video to introduce a concept, such as showing a clip from the film Far and Away for a unit on westward expansion or the Oklahoma land rush. We can preview important vocabulary items. We can share a photo to generate ideas and increase curiosity. We can complete a graphic organizer. Ask students to brainstorm, perhaps with limits. Give them maybe three minutes to think of as many different leaders associated with the civil rights movement, for example we can ask students to predict. Interestingly, research shows that students remember the information better if their prediction was wrong. Dissonance fosters retention. We can engage in an experiment, field trip, or role play. For instance, taking a field trip to a nearby zoo to see producers and consumers in action. Now, so far, this likely sounds like an important step to include in lessons for all students, right? Well, that's true. But I want to add an additional layer for our ELs, and that layer is culture. We need to ask ourselves, what am I assuming my ELs already know? What American culture is embedded in the textbooks and readings and videos and concepts and music that we use in our classroom? I'm going to say that again. Remember, repetition is key for retention. We must ask ourselves, what am I assuming my ELs already know? What American culture is embedded in the textbooks and readings and videos and concepts and music that we use in our classroom? For example, when I talk about red states versus blue states, do my English learners know what I'm referring to? Or when I discuss pro-choice versus pro-life, do they understand the meanings and implications of these phrases? And how about during casual conversations with our students? What do we assume our students know about the American culture? And what do we know about their culture? An obvious example might be asking a student, hey, did you have a nice Christmas? 
Or did you eat turkey and stuffing at Thanksgiving? There are a lot of assumptions in these kinds of questions. I want to be clear that our English learners have a rich and deep schemata, but it is likely very different than that of our mainstream students. In thinking back to my example about being on the Hudson Soccer Booster Club, there was actually a lot of local culture that made it hard for me to function and contribute. For example, I was asked to arrange a parents' night during a home game where we could ask the players to thank their parents publicly with a flower and photo button. Seems simple enough to me. What my colleagues assumed I knew is that I should choose a game where we would likely win and where the parent group from the opposing team would be especially respectful. I had to ask a lot of questions during my first year on the soccer board. Our English learners always aren't as brave and confident to ask these important questions. Now, since you will not be teaching about how to function on a soccer booster club, let's look at a content area in which many people believe there's not much culture to clarify. Math. A misconception exists among educators that since math uses symbols, it is culture-free and ideal for facilitating the transition of recent immigrant students into English instruction. This concept is true only of mathematical computations and cannot be applied to a context-based curriculum. So what are some cultural factors in math instruction? First, the metric system. There is more emphasis on decimals than fractions in countries that use the metric system. This is certainly not the case in the U.S. Also, certain procedural differences in how to solve problems can cause confusion for our ELs. For example, Vedic math is finding its way into academic curricula in India. It focuses on techniques to carry out numerical calculations in a faster way. I discovered this method from one of my first graders who had learned these techniques from his father. Also, numerical notation varies from culture to culture. Great Britain and the U.S. are two of the few places in the world that use a period to indicate the decimal place. Many other countries use a comma instead. Mental math versus showing work. Some countries, like the U.S., emphasize showing one's work, while other countries, like India, do not think this is necessary. There are also very basic differences in currencies around the world. The American coin size doesn't necessarily indicate the amount. The dime is smaller in size, but worth more than a nickel. And the bills are the same color and size, which is actually pretty rare around the world. In addition, cents represents percentages of a dollar, like $4.32, but some money systems don't use decimals in this manner. And finally, word problems. They are infamous for being full of cultural differences, which make it hard for our ELs to understand what is being asked of them. Let's take a peek at a specific word problem now. Betty's gas tank holds 17 gallons. The gauge on her dashboard reads half full. If gas costs $1.28 per gallon, about how much will it cost Betty to fill her tank? Now, what cultural background might we need to build for our ELs in this example? Well, we might need to start off by explaining that this story is about a car. We might explain the terms gas tank, gauge, and dashboard, and provide some visuals. And we might need to explain how much a gallon represents in comparison to a liter. Perhaps we would even clarify that Betty is the name of a woman. In the end, we might choose to just simply rewrite the story in a context of a bakery, a grocery store, or some other familiar context that exists in most cultures. So regardless of the specific content area you are teaching, I want to encourage you to ask yourselves the following questions with each lesson you deliver. What am I assuming my ELs already know? What American culture is embedded in the textbooks and readings and videos and concepts and music that we use in our classroom? Now, in addition to culture, an area that we need to build with each lesson is academic language or the language of the classroom. You are perhaps familiar with this triangle as a way to represent both BICs, or social language, and CALPs, our academic language. Tier 1 forms the base of the triangle and represents the social language used for everyday communication. This type of language is used when discussing what you did over the weekend and what you want to have for dinner. Tiers 2 and 3, on the other hand, represent academic language. Tier 2 includes words that are often untaught. They are general yet sophisticated and can oftentimes be more abstract than Tier 3 words. Tier 2 includes many words found on Bloom's taxonomy, which also happen to appear on many standardized tests. Words such as paraphrase, compare and contrast, synthesize, and evaluate. 
In addition, we find transition words, also known as connectives in Tier 2, words such as between, therefore, however, in effect, and nonetheless. Have you ever had to describe what nonetheless means to someone? Try and you will realize that this is indeed an academic term. In essence, Tier 2 are words that are necessary in constructing coherent thought. In contrast, Tier 3 words are academic terms specific to each domain or content area. They include words such as isosceles triangle and supply and demand and sedimentary rock. Teachers tend to focus on Tier 3 because, well, they are the bolded items in their texts. They are the essence of what they teach and what they love to talk about. Jeff Sweers, a senior researcher at Stanford University, created the analogy of bricks and mortar to describe how Tier 2 and Tier 3 words relate to each other. He said that Tier 2 words are the mortar, while Tier 3 words are the bricks. Although I'm no mason, I know that in order to have a solid wall, we need both bricks and mortar. In fact, if we only have bricks and no mortar, then the wall will fall. So with this analogy, Zwiers wants us to understand that we need to have the mortar, the Tier 2, in order for our ELs to build their academic voice. In an effort to focus on the mortar, the Tier 2 words, I would encourage you to post a Bloom's Taxonomy poster in your room for you and your students to reference. Incorporate specific Tier 2 phrases into your lesson plans and provide specific sentence stems and transition words for your oral and written activities. For example, during any classroom discussion, we can teach students to use Tier 2 connective phrases as they agree and disagree with each other. Phrases such as, in contrast to what so-and-so said, I feel that, I see your point, however, I would like to justify my answer by saying that, in spite of the positives of, a key aspect to this subject is, teaching and practicing these kinds of polite conversation starters will also help your students hone their social skills. You might agree with me that some fully matured adults have not yet acquired this skill. Now, I would like to share some research that is helpful in thinking about how to teach both Tier 2 and Tier 3 academic language in any content area. Several researchers have determined four main principles that should guide instruction. Number one, students should be active in developing their understanding of words and ways to learn them. Two, students should personalize word learning. Three, students should be immersed in words. And four, students should build on multiple sources of information to learn words through repeated exposures. So let's talk about how to build academic language of science and keep these four ideas in mind, active, personalized, immersed, and repeated. As we know, science is filled with technical academic language. Students must understand vocabulary items related to the topic, the scientific process, and the experimental procedures. Since many of these technical terms come from Greek and Latin roots, an effective strategy for teaching science academic language is to teach morphology, or the affixes of words, the word parts. For example, let's say that we are talking about simple sugars or carbohydrates, and we want to introduce the word monosaccharide, which means simple sugar, like glucose. To teach academic language using morphology, we would then tell our students that mono, or mon, means one, singular, alone. This would help them understand other science-related words, such as monocrystal, or monosaturated, and monoxide but it would also help our students comprehend other non-science words like monarchy, monogamy, monopoly, and monotone. Now, how exactly can we teach morphology? Well, we could personalize this experience by asking students to create a list of words beginning with mono or mon, and then put them into a sentence, perhaps incorporating some tier two sentence stems. We could also have students actively help us create a word wall with the different affixes. Each student would illustrate one word to post on the wall. This would both immerse students in these words and also provide ample opportunities for repeated exposures as you refer to the items on the wall throughout your lessons. Besides teaching morphology and using word walls, other ways to build academic language include the following ideas. Teach words from a context or theme. Provide visual associations. Teach strategies to guess unfamiliar words. Play games. Use word sorts. Word sorts are not just for spelling words. This is a great technique for content words as well. Use a concept definition map. Even the simplest graphic organizer can be helpful. 
And again, in using any of these techniques, try to keep these four ideas in mind. Active, personalized, immersed, and repeated exposures. I would like to end this session with another explanation of how to do laundry, using many of the words and ideas from our original confusing example at the beginning of this video. I would like you to imagine that I am teaching beginning ELs how to do laundry. In other words, our content for this demonstration is how to do laundry. As you view, please think about these two questions. Number one, what specific improvements were made in building background for students? And two, how was the acquisition of academic language fostered? And how was this language made accessible to students? Okay, are you ready? Okay, let's go. Class, today we are going to talk about doing laundry. Doing laundry. What's that, you may wonder? Well, doing laundry is washing your clothes. Washing your clothes. This needs to be done after you wear clothes once or a few times. In America, we use a washing machine and a dryer. I know that many of you dry your clothes outside, but a drying machine, called a dryer, is very common in America, especially in the winter. So I will describe how to do laundry using both a washing machine and a dryer. First, you arrange the clothes into different groups based on their color. You wash the white clothes together, and then you wash the colored clothes together. This is so that the colored clothes, especially the red clothes, don't get their color on the white clothes. They must be separate. Next, you need to find a washing machine, either in your house or nearby. You put your clothes inside the machine, and then you add a special soap called detergent. Now, it's important not to wash too many clothes together because then they won't get clean. Also, you don't want to use very much detergent. Just add a little bit. After washing your clothes, you put them in the dryer. After they are dry, you fold the clothes and place them back where you found them. Then, when you want to wash again, you just repeat this cycle. So, what did you think? How was background built better than in the original example? How was academic language fostered in this example? Feel free to review the original example by scrolling back earlier in the video. I look forward to seeing your responses in the forum. Thank you.